Hi, I want to talk today about David Hume on causation. It's one of Hume's most distinctive and most surprising philosophical theses because when he follows out his method, it turns out all sorts of things have to be committed to the flames, as he puts it dramatically. All sorts of things turn out either to be meaningless or to have a meaning that is not at all what we thought. We trace them back to origins in experience, and sometimes we find there is no origin in experience. This is made up out of thin air. It's bad news. It's utterly meaningless. There is no content. Other times we find out, well, it does have a content, but it's not what we thought. And that's what's going to happen with causation. He's not going to say causation is meaningless, but he is going to say, actually, what's going on with it is very different from what you might have thought. You thought you were describing a relation in the world. You're not. You're doing something else. So let's take a look at how this goes. Hume is considering causal inferences. Sometimes we go from cause to effect. So we say, aha, here is lightning. So expect thunder. Sometimes we go from the effect to the cause, as when we hear thunder and think there must have been lightning. Sometimes it's going to be, let's say, in a medical context where we see a symptom and we say, aha, that's evidence that the underlying cause is this illness. Or sometimes we find out that somebody's tested positive for an illness and we say, aha, here's what you can expect. Here are the various symptoms you might start to exhibit. Well, we make inferences then on the basis of causation, sometimes from cause to effect, sometimes from effect to cause, sometimes from just observing regularities in the world to thinking there is a causal relation. What, what justifies those kinds of inferences? Inferences from a causal relation to an effect or a cause, inferences to a causal relation from various bits of evidence. Well, Hume says it's actually tricky to understand this. Why? Well, first of all, the inference doesn't seem to be something that rests on anything a priori. Why? Because we can imagine it otherwise. I can imagine that this symptom has a different cause from the disease I thought. I can imagine that that loud boom was not actually caused by lightning, but was, let's say, a sonic boom produced by an airplane. I can go in the other direction and think, well, aha, a bit of lightning. I'm going to hear thunder, and then I don't hear it. Or it could turn out that, okay, people with this disease generally exhibit these symptoms, so expect this to happen, and it doesn't happen. I'm free of that symptom. Yay! <laughs> Good thing for me. But it turns out that, in short, that doesn't always happen, and there's no necessity, and I can, in any case, easily imagine it happening otherwise. It certainly is the case that having something tossed up in the air generally leads to it coming down, but, of course, that, that could vary, that could change. I can imagine it just continuing to go up or just lingering in the air. And similarly, normally, my hitting a ball with a pull cue will cause it to move, but I can easily imagine that I hit it and it doesn't move for some reason. So I can imagine it otherwise. There's no necessity to this idea of causal relations, at least not the kind of necessity that means I can't imagine it otherwise. So Hume puts it this way. The inference we draw from cause to effect is not derived merely from a survey of these particular objects and from such a penetration into their essences as may discover the dependence of one upon the other. There's no object that implies the existence of any other if we consider these objects in themselves and never look beyond the ideas we form of them. Such an inference would amount to knowledge. It would imply the absolute contradiction and impossibility of conceiving anything different. But as all distinct ideas are separable, it's evident there can be no imp impossibility of that kind. In other words, our knowledge of causation can't be a priori. I can't just reflect on the nature of billiard balls and say that, oh, striking them will cause them to move. I can't just reflect on the nature of thunder and realize it's caused by lightning. These are not things that are part of the concept. It's really about the world. And so we can imagine all sorts of wild things, right? We can imagine that seeing a statue of David Hume in Edinburgh immediately makes people fall in love. It's like a love potion. Well, I can imagine that. In fact, there is no such causal relation. I can imagine whenever two people fall in love, a statue of David Hume appears. Of course, that doesn't happen either. But in short, we can imagine anything. That doesn't tell us anything about causal relations and whether they do or don't exist. So we quite reasonably infer any causal inference is really a posteriori. It's something that can only be discovered on the basis of experience. And indeed, Hume says, look, yeah, of course, <laughs> it's by experience only we can infer the existence of one object from that of another, or the existence or occurrence of one event on the basis of another. 
However, he says, here's the problem. <laughs> when we think it's derived from experience, we start looking for the origin of that idea and experience, and we don't find it. He says, actually, it can't be a posteriori because we don't experience the causal link. You might think we do. I see the lightning and then I hear the thunder, or I strike the ball with a pull cue and it does move. But he says, oh, don't be misled. <laughs> what are you seeing there? Are you seeing the connection between the lightning and the thunder? Are you seeing the connection between the motion of the cue and the motion of the ball? You're not seeing the connection. You're just seeing the motion of one and the motion of the other. Or in the case of lightning, you're seeing the flash. And then you're hearing the thunder. A, a little while later, you hope. <laughs> and you're just seeing one thing and then another. You're not seeing any link between them. So Hume says, let's think about the cause of motion, like the cause of motion of cogs in a machine or of a billiard ball. He says motion in one body is regarded upon impulse as the cause of motion in another, like the cue stick and the ball. When we consider these objects with the utmost attention, we find only that one object approaches the other, that the motion of it precedes that of the other, but without any sensible interval, tis vain to rack ourselves with further thought and reflection upon this subject. We can go no farther in considering this particular instance. So what do we get? We think about this kind of motion. The cue stick moves. We see it move first. The ball is stationary. Then there's contact. Then the ball moves. How did that happen? <laughs> okay. We see now contiguity. There was contact. So the cue stick did touch the ball. We see a succession. We see motion of cue stick followed by motion of ball. But we don't see what links them. We don't see the connection. We see the one move, then the other move. At a, it starts when there's contact. But what happens at that point of contact? Can we look in there? Let's say we get a magnifying glass and I say, okay, you hit the ball now. I'm still not going to see the connection. I will see one motion followed by another motion. That's it. So Hume says, when we look about us toward external objects and consider the operation of causes, we're never able in a single instance to discover any power or necessary connection. Any quality that binds the effect to the cause and renders the one an infallible consequence of the other, we never find such a thing. We never observe the causal relation. We don't see the connection. We just see one thing followed by another. <laughs> Frank O'Malley once said, life is just one damn, damn thing after another. And that's basically Hume's position. Life is just one damn thing after another. And so we just get this followed by that. We start talking about causes, but we never observe anything that is the origin of our idea of causal relations. At least we don't observe it in the world. It's not there in watching the billiard balls, in watching the lightning and hearing the thunder. We never see it. What do we find? We find constant conjunction. We only find that one does actually follow the other. The impulse of one billiard ball is attended with motion in the second. This is the hold that appears to the outward senses. I see the motion of the cue stick, the motion of the cue ball, the motion of another ball. That's all I perceive. I don't see anything beyond that constant conjunction. This moves, that moves. I don't see the link. So in, upon the whole, Hume says, there appears not throughout all nature any one instance of connection which is conceivable by us. All events seem entirely loose and separate. One event follows another, but we can never observe any tie between them. They seem conjoined, but never connected. The lightning followed by the thunder keeps happening. But do we see the necessity? Do we see the connection? No. <laughs> this is a little joke based on this. Don't give me that constant conjunction doesn't imply causal connection, Hokum. It's yours. Well, anyway, there is a kind of infinite regress argument lurking here. Hume says when we infer effects from causes, we must establish the existence of these causes, which we have only two ways of doing, either by an immediate perception of our memory or senses, or by an inference from other causes. Which causes, again, we've got to ascertain in the same manner, either by a present impression or by an inference from their causes, and so on till we arrive at some object which we see or remember. It's impossible for us to carry on our inferences ad infinitum. The only thing that can stop them is an impression of the memory or senses, beyond which there's no room for doubt or inquiry. So we get a classic infinite regress argument here. We infer some causes and effects in the world. Well, we can infer a causal relation only from causal relations, unless we can actually find that connection in the world, which we can't, he says. 
So we get a causal relation only from causal relations. But that can't go on to infinity. Any inference to cause and effect must start with an impression, a perception of something. Okay, causal relations can't just lead us around within that circle. In the end, we can't go on to infinity. It's got to be some, from something outside that circle, something that rests on an impression, an experience, a perception of something. But now we don't find the connection in the world. We just find one thing followed by another. So how is that going to work? The transition from an impression present to the memory or senses, the idea of an object, which we call cause or effect, is founded on past experience and our remembrance of their constant conjunction. We just have the constant conjunction, the contiguity, the succession. The, the succession. That is to say, we have the conjunction of this motion, that motion, or that flash, that boom. And that leads us to draw a causal conclusion. But now Hume says, that's weird because I can't find the perception. I don't see us seeing the link. And so he says, this whole inference, admittedly we do that. We see the constant conjunction, we move to a causal conclusion. But is that based on reason or is it based on something else? He says, if reason determined, it proceed upon the principle that instances of which we've had no experience must resemble those of which we've had experience. And that the course of nature continues always uniformly the same. Well, we'd have to have rational grounds for that principle. But where could we get that? Ah, he says, there's nowhere to get it. There can be no demonstrative arguments to prove that those instances that we haven't experienced resemble those of which we have had experience. We can imagine a change in the course of nature, which sufficiently proves that such a change isn't absolutely impossible. To form a clear idea of anything is an undeniable argument for its possibility. So I can conceive of a future that's radically different from the past. And when I conceive of that, you might say it's the job of science fiction writers to do that, well, I'm imagining just the kind of change. So there can't be any rational, demonstrative, deductive argument for the claim that the future will resemble the past. Well, is there a probabilistic argument? Well, in general, the past has resembled what came before it, so I guess it's okay to assume that our future is going to resemble our past. But wait, what you're saying is there was a regularity in the past that the future would resemble the past. Huh. I can't say the future is likely to resemble the past because it always has in the past and so it's going to in the future. That just looks like a circular argument. And so that won't work either. It can't be a deductive argument. It can't be an inductive argument based on past experience. We can't have any argument for it at all. So, Hume says, we've got to seek something outside reason. Here's how we find it. He says, think about a single case. Okay, one case of that cause leading to that effect. One flash of lightning leading to thunder. Do we infer cause and effect from that? No, right? The first time a child experiences a thunderstorm and sees a flash of lightning and hears thunder, they don't immediately say, aha, lightning caused thunder. Nobody's going to guess that from a single case. And so Hume says, we don't get this sort of conclusion at all from one case, but we can get it from multiple cases. If we observe several instances, where the same things are always conjoined together, we conceive a connection between them and begin to draw an inference from one to the other. It's that multiplicity of resembling instances that constitute the very essence of power and connection, and it's the source where the idea of it arises. That's where we get this. Some, something about the repetition of cases gives us this idea from which we get the concepts of power, of connection, of causation. But he says, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't get it. Repetition can't give us any new idea, can it? I mean, it just is a perfectly similar instance. If we don't get the idea from one, we're not going to get it from a bunch of them. And so that doesn't make any sense. All our ideas are copied from impressions. We get the same impressions of the external world. It's just the same thing again and again. No new impressions are happening. No new ideas are happening. So look, it can't be found in one of these. It's not going to be found in multiple. So what's the source? We might expect him at this point to conclude there is no source. But that's not where he goes. He says something new does happen. The repetition does something, but what does it do? It affects me. It forms a new impression, not a new impression of the world. It's not that I suddenly see something in the lightning or the thunder or the motions of the billiard balls that I didn't see before. It's instead that I get a feeling of expectation. 
I see it enough times that I see the flash of lightning, I expect the thunder. I hit the ball, I expect the ball to move, and I expect it to contact and hit other balls and make them move. So I feel a determination of the mind to pass from one thing to another. That's all the that changes, my feeling, my feeling of expectation. From one instance, I can infer nothing causal at all. From repeated instances, we infer the causal link, but nothing in the world changes. What does our feeling of expectation? There is a new impression, but it's not a new impression of anything going on in the world. It's a new impression in us. It is a purely internal impression. So the origin of our idea of causation is this constant conjunction of events leading to a feeling of expectation, an internal impression in us. And that gives us the ideas of causation and necessity. But notice, the source is in us, it's not in the world. Necessity is the effect of this observation, and nothing but an internal impression of the mind. The necessity is something that exists in the mind, not in objects. So the source of necessity, of causation, is not in the world. Those ideas come from something in us. It exists in the mind, not in objects. We project that regularity onto the world. The mind, he says, has a great propensity to spread itself on external objects. And that's what we're doing when we talk about necessity or causation. We're projecting that onto the world. We can't find sources for certain of these ideas in the world, but we do find the source in experience. It's just not in the world, it's in us. The source is an internal impression. And it's gonna turn out that that's true of lots of ideas. Not just causation and necessity, but substance, matter, the self, identity, morality. The source of all of those is gonna be internal and we project them onto the world. So he says in the end, it is feeling, it is this internal feeling that leads to belief in all of those things.